illusion as you ultimately hear the music played back through your phonograph that you have the best seat in the concert hall. How do they do it? Well, the recording music director or any one of the sound engineers could easily explain it all in 10 weeks. But let's just take a look at three of the fundamental requirements of high fidelity recording. The first is full dynamic range. That's the spread between the softest and loudest passages in the music. In a concert performance, the range is as wide as the conductor feels the score indicates. These meters on the recording console indicate the volume of sound coming from the orchestra onto the magnetic tape. In the old days, home phonographs could not reproduce either full loud passages or very soft passages. So they were literally kept off the record right here by sound monitoring. But it wasn't a faithful reproduction of the actual performance, such as you get with today's high fidelity recording techniques. Today, as it should be, the conductor and his musicians control all of the dynamics including all of the natural shadings, just as they do in a concert. And after the recording begins, the engineer never touches the controls. The full dynamic power of the orchestra is faithfully transferred to the recording tape. The second requirement is somewhat similar, achieving natural balance between all instruments and sections of the orchestra. This can only be achieved by precise microphone placement. And this varies amazingly with the music, the particular artists, the hall itself, even climatic conditions. It is never the same from one recording session to another. Again, an easy solution might be found here by the arbitrary placement and control of many microphones. But again, it wouldn't be natural or faithful reproduction. Today, the engineers record the orchestra as a complete unit. The third important requirement in a high fidelity recording is frequency range. Capturing high notes as well as low this is actually accomplished before the session begins. All it takes is recording equipment of enormous cost and capacity, such as this recording console. It faithfully handles all sounds audible to the human ear. The entire frequency spectrum from 20 to 20,000 cycles per second. And with less than two tenths of 1% distortion, it transfers them to the swiftly spinning magnetic tape. A new challenge here is stereophonic recording. This requires dual mics, dual track tape machines, and a stereophonic mixer. But for those who have the equipment, it also permits two system or stereophonic playback in the home. There are other high fidelity requirements, such as presence, definition, clarity. But with time and patience, and enough retakes, they get on the record too. Eventually, there is a playback that everyone recognizes as the image they were seeking, both artistically and acoustically. They have a truly faithful recording of Romeo and Juliet. And we are one step closer to having it in our homes. Next stop, New York City and the precise engineering business of transferring the recorded sound from tape to a disc called the Lacquer Master. This disc is the grandfather of the records to come later. Let's look at the steps in the cutting of our Lacquer Master. Most of the sound factors are already known. The speed of the tape in recording, its playing time, and the sound level required. These factors must be considered for both 45 RPM and long play lacquer masters. A special lacquer master disc is closely inspected. For the 12 inch long play record, 
The master is 16 inches in diameter. For 45 extended play records, the master is 12 inches in diameter. In both cases, the extra width allows plenty of working room in cutting. Besides a spindle for centering, the turntable has a number of holes. Through these holes, air suction holds the lacquer disc down tightly, so it is perfectly flat on the turntable. The playing time of the music determines the number of grooves per inch that will be cut into the record. The sound dynamics of the music determine how far apart the grooves must be. Loud passages need more space between grooves. Soft passages need less. The cutting machine automatically spaces the music grooves according to the sound signal it's receiving. Now, a test cut to determine the groove width. The groove width must be exact, so exact that it is carefully checked through a microscope. Everything set, and a coarse pitch lead-in groove is cut to the music area. The tape machine is started, and exactly one and a half turns before the music begins, the cutting head automatically changes from the lead-in groove to fine pitch music grooves. The cutting stylus is a minute piece of sapphire, perfectly ground and electrically heated so there is virtually no resistance as it cuts into the smooth lacquer. During the cutting operation, a constant watch is kept on the groove width to make sure it never varies from the prescribed setting. It all sounds so simple when you're just skimming the surface. Actually, of course, it's a painstaking and delicate operation. But in time, you have a perfect lacquer master. The original tape goes into the vault for safekeeping to take its place forever alongside many other priceless performances by the world's greatest artists. All the artistry of the Romeo and Juliet performance is being carefully preserved. And we're another step closer to having that performance in our own living rooms. Next stop, Indianapolis, Indiana one of three processing plants to which our lacquer master might go. We start in production control. Here, every lacquer master is assigned a shadow, a special business machine card. From now on, this card can lead you straight to our particular recording, no matter where it might be in processing. The processing is identical for long play and 45 RPM records. First, the grooves in the lacquer master are carefully rechecked through a microscope. They have to be perfect. Now we proceed to make metal copies from the lacquer master. The first step, silvering. This takes precisely two minutes and 40 seconds. And the lacquer master comes out with a new face. Now by patient electroplating, we add a series of metallic deposits, one behind the other. First, a fine grain deposit of nickel. This makes smooth walled grooves and a quieter surface. Next, a thin deposit of copper over the nickel. A nice smooth salmon pink. Now, a whirling bath in another tank. A much heavier buildup of copper. We'll see why in a moment. We now have a master disc that is apparently all back and no front. But watch. Now we have two fronts and two masters. The original lacquer master is on the left. A new silver-faced master is on the right. But this is the point where most people long for a road map. Let's make one. We started with the lacquer master. To the face of it, we added first silver, then nickel, then copper. 
and finally, a lot more copper. Then we separate the lacquer from the metal. Now we have both our original lacquer master and a new silver faced or metal master. The grooves in the lacquer master make it a positive. It can be played. The matching ridges on the metal master make it a negative. It cannot be played. We continue work with the metal master, repeating the gradual metal buildup to make another part. Then, another separation. The metal master is at the left, and the new part, called a mold, is at the right. We have progressed from the original positive to a negative to another positive. The metal master... Put in in the direction of the cutting line, not across it. And just enough pins to hold the pattern in place. Cutting line? What's that? The heavy line around each piece. Do you cut inside that line? No, no, no. You cut exactly on the line with long, firm slashes. Betty's pattern has V-shaped marks showing what seams are to be joined. She has cut these out onto the material, or she could clip them into the seam allowance. Arrow-shaped lines indicate darts. Other important points are indicated by dots. All of these Betty marks with tailor's tacks, taking a double stitch through pattern and material. She clips the top loops, lifts the pattern off the material, and clips the thread between the fabric layers. The fabric now separates easily with both pieces clearly marked. She runs a basting thread down the center of her blouse and skirt. Thus, when she fits her dress, she'll know whether the centers hang straight. What is she stitching? She's making stay stitches along curved edges so they won't pull out of shape. These preliminaries are important. It pays to be very careful about them. Now she bases her darts from the point to the wide end. How does a girl know where to begin? She just follows her instruction sheet, step by step. First, she matches the notches previously cut and pins the pieces together. What's that thing? The seam line printed on the pattern pieces shows how deep to take each seam. To keep the basting even, you use a gauge or a tape measure. Even seams mean better fit. She's ready to baste in the sleeves. Putting in sleeves is simple if you follow the pattern's instructions. Using a long stitch on the machine, Betty has already put in two rows of gathers between the notches. One slightly inside the seam line, and one between the seam line and the edge. With the basted dress wrong side out, and the basted sleeve right side out, the sleeve is set in the armhole notches at the front. Matching the double notches at the back. Matching the underarm seams and with sleeve top at shoulder top. Pin, draw up gathers to fit. Fasten the gathering threads. And this. Simple, isn't it? It doesn't sound hard, but I want to see how the dress looks on Betty. So does Betty. But right here she makes any fitting adjustments that may be needed. Maybe I shouldn't criticize, but aren't the shoulders a bit droopy? She's forgotten her shoulder pads. Shoulder pads must be pinned in place for all fittings. Those darts need to be taken in. That's hard to do by yourself. Let's help her. <laughs> oh, after all, a good pattern is one of a girl's best friends. So, we have a right to be there. 
This will fix it. And after she takes the dress apart and rebase those darts, she can stitch. Must a girl tie herself up in knots to stitch? Betty, straighten up. Remember, correct posture at the machine. What is she stitching? A dart, starting the wide end and tapering off to nothing at the point. Watch how carefully she fastens the threads. She's a regular boy scout with that knot. I suppose the bastings come out now? Yes, but she clips them before pulling them out. Is she through with her stitching? She's pressing. Only the dart she just stitched. Press as you go is a rule of good sewing. It helps achieve that professional look. See, she has pressed the dart toward the center of the garment. There. She's finishing her stitching. The next step is to hang the hem, and it takes two for that. We must help her again. How many inches from the floor, Betty? I know that. I read in the paper yesterday that skirts are 13 inches from the floor. My home economics teacher says to make skirts the most becoming length. Your teacher is right. Naturally, you don't want your skirt so much shorter or longer than the average that you'll be conspicuous. But an inch or so, one way or the other, won't matter. There. That's done. Now to put in the hem. And easy does it. Hemming stitches must not be pulled tight. And tack in the shoulder pads or put them in with snap fasteners. Is that all there is to making a dress? Except for a final once over with the iron. And <laughs> that's easy because she's pressed each seam as she stitched it. Do you like it, Johnny? I'll say I do. Want to see some quick change magic? Well, there's a brand new dress. Now, of course, nobody could make it in just a few minutes, as Betty seems to have done, but it could be made in one weekend by anyone who knows the fundamentals of sewing. Try it yourself, and you'll see. Quite a fashion show, aren't I? Betty, I've got it. Why don't you and the other girls put on a fashion show to get money for new equipment for the basketball team? Wonderful, Johnny. The girls will be crazy about it. Sure. I'm going to call up my home economics teacher right now and see if she'll help. Your patent catalog is a book of magic for it transforms all who use it into creative artists. Yes, just as the portrait artist uses the paints and brushes to express his impression of a personality, so you can use fabrics and lines and colors to express your own personality. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to our little fashion show. You'll be glad to know that the basketball team is $112 richer because you came. Now, don't expect anything grand. These clothes are just what we've made in our clothing class this past semester. I hope you'll like them. Wouldn't you like to look this cool on a summer day? White does wonders for your suntan and takes any color accessories. This basic dress goes smartly to sports events, to school, or to the movies with a boyfriend. A bright colored boxy jacket takes care of cool evenings. Now here's a grand idea. Plan a wardrobe that makes two outfits do the work of several. For instance, the three button jacket of this green wool suit can be combined with the other costume's plaid skirt to make a third ensemble. Or, you can team up the green turtleneck blouse with the green suit skirt, and you have a fourth smart outfit. Schoolmates, the corduroy jumper and the gabardine sack dress, both with a new angle. The jumper has a swishy circular back contrasting with a prim square bodice. And there's a clipper trick in the sack dress. 
a belted-in shoulder scarf ending in a pocket. Sailor, beware. Here's the new midi dress, a long torso top over a box-pleated skirt. Matt, mix your colors. Make sleeves long or short. Both of these dresses are of wool jersey. Betty tells me that blouses and skirts rate A plus with schoolgirls. Here's a combination in jersey and striped wool, good for fall or spring. The deep armhole is not only smart, it's comfortable too. A wide belt gives the new look of small waistline and rounded hips. Striped cotton shines at the beach, the pool, or even in the garden. This dirndl skirt wraps around in buttons. When you want to complete your suntan, take it off. Throw it over your shoulders too, like a shawl when you've had enough sun on your back. Can't you see this outfit pedaling along on a bicycle, going to a picnic, looking very gay in fact at any of summer's fun spots. It's new fashion to look old fashioned. Candy pink plaid taffeta rustles its quaint bustle and flirts a lace dust ruffle. And so Betty's fashion show ends. But everywhere, sewing machines are humming, preparing for the fashion shows girls put on every day when they step out in the clothes they've made for themselves. Happy sewing to you all. Another star is born. Mary Martin, co-starring with Jack Benny and Fred Allen in Paramount Pictures, Love Thy Neighbor, is at LaGuardia Airport, New York City, to bid bon voyage to the new Latin discovery, Esther Fernandez, who is flying west for a screen test. TWA announces the departure of the Super Sky Chief Strata Liner for Chicago, Kansas City, Albuquerque, and Los Angeles. Gate number three. All aboard, please. In a few short years, the travel habits of millions of women have changed to this comfortable and smooth mode of transportation, just as their modes of dress have shifted from the uncomfortable bustle and hobble skirts of yesterday. Day and night, these mighty ships of commerce fly the air lanes from Atlantic to Pacific, spanning the nation in 15 hours. Up, up, high up into the substratosphere rises the 45-ton TWA Stratoliner. On into a night sky, the big silver liner speeds swiftly over sleeping villages and great cities. Dawn finds our air voyagers flying over the Texas panhandle and the colorful mesas of New Mexico. It's a fairyland of tumbling castles far above where the raindrops form. Bridging the horizons in seven league boots, our passengers ride comfortably in altitude conditioned cabins. Let's take a peek in the Stratoliner and see how our passenger is doing. Why, of course, like every woman, she's taking a last look in the mirrors of the Stratoliner's charm room. Bienvenido, buenos dias, senorita. She is trimly tailored in a Cyril Johnson covert cloth suit. Met by Dee Lawrence, fashion editor of Paramount, Esther is told she is to get off her plane and act in a location picture with four other studio players, just now landing from Hollywood. First is lovely Martha O'Driscoll of screen and radio fame. Margaret Hayes from the New York stage in Hollywood is next. While pretty Virginia Dale follows and waves to movie fans gathered at the airport.
Take notice of the smart airplane luggage that the air passengers are using. It's Halliburton luggage, especially travel tested by TWA for air passengers. Metal alloys make for light weight and durability. As the baggage is unloaded, we hear a rhythmic chant. A group of Pueblo Indians, who are to appear with Esther in the screen test, beat out a buffalo dance, while a bronzed young brave stamps out the ancient hunting steps of the Navajos. His bow and arrow marks the cadence as he flourishes them in the dance.